little while ago, I took a walk back along memory lane and talked about the first Descendants film from the Disney Channel and how despite having no right to be so good, it absolutely was a banger. One of the Disney Channel's most popular franchises, a ratings juggernaut, dank in every single way, but so fun as well. And so I figured, eh, why not go back down that rabbit hole? Why not take a look at the second film? And yeah, once again, it is a film that is vastly more successful than you'd expect it would be, based on what it looks like in promotional materials and trailers and whatnot. It was a little bit more of a mild critical success compared to the first film, with a critical score of 71% on Rotten Tomatoes compared to the monster 90% rating of the first movie, but it did score higher with audiences overall, a score of 69% compared to 66%. On top of that, it really did pull in some absurd ratings. Whilst it was slightly down on the first one's numbers on Disney Channel, across all networks, it exploded with 8.92 million viewers that night, and on delay, 21 million viewers. Like, jeez, my god. This thing was keeping Disney's cable rating stable. <laughs> and so yeah, despite seemingly having the appearance of mediocrity, this movie, it once again, it makes it work in the dankest of ways. Not even so bad it's good, just good in general, but in a way that makes no sense. I honestly think I prefer the first film, but regardless, this one is a good time, so nothing much else for it but to dive right in. Okay, so we start off the film with a song, just to get us hyped up and interested, because this bad boy's like two hours long. How they manage to fill that runtime, I don't really know, but they do. And yeah, so many ways to be wicked, an absolute banger of a song, seriously, so good. It's hype, it gets you into the film instantly, although once again, it has the same problem the first film had, and it has this across basically every single song, but even worse this time, in that the voice is so overproduced, so epic, so loud, and yet the actors for the most part are not moving their mouths when they sing very expressively. They're very blank-faced a lot of the time, and so it looks rather goofy, like it's very, very obviously been dubbed over. Oh well. And so yeah, they have this big hype song about how it's cool to be the bad guy, only for it to be revealed that this was all in fact some sort of daydream for Mal. And she is actually, well she's for some reason having a massive press conference. Once again, the fact that they're modernizing the fairy tales, like, ugh, gets on my nerves a little bit, like, film cameras, microphones, come on. But I can look past it. Although, I still can't get past the fact that this country has a teenager as their king. A king who's still in high school and seemingly is running the country at the same time from inside the high school. How is this stable? How is this efficient? What kind of system of government is this? Anyway, the journalists absolutely bungle the press conference or whatever this was. They shout over Mal's answers. They ask intrusive questions. And so in the end, they get nothing, no responses. And also Mal's look here. It is certainly a choice. She's gone full Disney princess, and like, I don't hate it, honestly, but it also feels really jarring. It's like the actress was on set before she had her costume and wig put on for the shoot. Doesn't feel like she fits in. Mal is dragged off by Evie for a gown fitting for some royal event they have on at some point later in the week, and Ben, he has a council meeting that he's late for, and he's struggling, clearly struggling, to balance this and school and his personal life. Hmm. Hmm. Maybe making a teenager the king was in fact not the smart play. And who would have thought? Oh wait, that's right, me. Honestly, his dad has so much to answer for, not just in creating this dystopian society where the villain kids get locked on a prison island, but for also completely and utterly ruining his son's life by making him king way, way, way too early in his life. Father of the year right here. And then the mob returns to swarm Ben, as if they only just noticed he was there, even though he told them to clear off. Hmm. Bit odd there. Moving on, Mal's getting fitted by Evie. I don't like that dress. And then we see on the news that Mal and Ben have been doing lots of appearances and whatnot, and they have like 20 more events after this big upcoming event. Jeez, they're working this girl to the bone. Like she isn't even his wife yet. She's been dating him for six months. It's a bit wild she has to attend all this shit to begin with, but I digress. And she's on the news having dined with Aladdin and Jasmine. And I noticed that she was wearing clothing that is like Agrabah inspired, trying to be part of it all. Ben thought, nah, screw it. I'm the king. I don't have to. <laughs> also, couldn't they have found an extra that actually looks like he'd live in Agrabah? Like, look at this dude in the back. <laughs> and it also looks like Mal is feeling the pressure. She uses magic to learn all the stuff she needs in order to keep up appearances. Is there a reason that Belle isn't like helping her through this though? She's been the queen for so long, she's just chucking her in the deep end? No? This absolute rookie having to learn as she goes? Who is running this kingdom? Oh, that's right, a teenage boy with no experience. Nice. Anyway, Evie and Mal have a heart-to-heart, -heart, where it's hinted that Mal is really struggling with being a straight-laced 
goody two shoes, whilst Evie, she's pretty happy with their lives, living in a castle school in a private room of two. She's popular, she's admired. I can see why she isn't keen to return to the slum. Also, my god, there's a program on the TV of Mal and Ben feeding each other chocolate strawberries. Imagine! Imagine seeing actual world leaders doing this shit. It is absurd. And I get that this is, you know, sort of an American analogue kind of place, and they love this kind of TV. But even then, you would never, ever, ever see Joe Biden or Donald Trump or whoever sitting down, getting fed chocolate strawberries by their wife on the news. Who cooked this up? Delicious cringe! We then catch up with the other two members of the group, where they meet up with the girls. Jay, well, he's moved very much into his obvious position of school heartthrob, and fair enough. And he looks pretty much the same. But Carlos? Nah, bro. <laughs> they did him dirty with this wig. Oh, not only does the style look kind of bad, but that wig is cheap. Look at fuzz. It's just fuzzy everywhere. It's terrible. Can't stop chuckling when he's on screen. <laughs> He looks like somebody went to the dollar store and bought a budget Daenerys Targaryen wig and chopped it up. Anyway, he tries to ask out Jane and he fails and it's cringy and they're building up to it, you know? And then Jane blasts Mal with endless questions about party planning and decorations because apparently she's in charge of it all. And Mal is also the one who has to pick everything despite not being the actual queen. I'm sorry, but where are all the actual adults? Why is this girl who has been here for six months in charge of everything and why does she have to pick it all? And why is the daughter of the fairy godmother, who only six months ago had a mental breakdown and released Maleficent, who almost killed everybody, being given any sort of responsibility? I am begging somebody above the age of 18 to step up! My god. Step the fuck up, okay. Then they reveal that the Royal Cotillion is a pre-engagement engagement party, and once again, they are 16 or 17, and they're already on the way to marrying them off. She's been dating him for six months. This would be a red flag for me. But on top of that, she has no real knowledge of what's happening. They just assume that she knows. What is going on here? She's only been out of prison for six months. How are the adults? How is no one not stepping up to guide this poor girl? And two, how are they letting this happen so quickly? What is wrong with this kingdom? Yikes, to say the least. Meanwhile, we learn that Evie has become rich by making clothes for all the other students, to the point that Doug, who still looks like a massive dweeb, although I will admit this is his best look in the franchise, says that she'll be able to afford her own castle in a couple of years. And this is just from six months of work. And then she'll be able to spend millions and millions of dollars to buy a castle based on the luxury real estate websites that I went on. How much are these kids paying her? How many students are coming to her for clothes? How does she have any time for school at all? What is going on? And yet, yeah, kind of continues in this direction. Just setting a lot of things in motion for the plot. Like Mal continues to struggle with her schedule, having forgotten to make a picnic with all of Ben's favourite foods, and having to rely on magic to get it done. And we also get a scene where Lonnie, Mulan's daughter, tries to join the tourney team. And she ends up whooping Jay in a really cool sequence. The choreography here, on point. And then, through the introduction of Chad, whose look here, well, his hair, isn't it, go back to the shorter look I reckon, Jay doesn't let Lonnie on the team, because, you know, Chad is an asshole. Bummer. Oh, and Carlos once again crashes and burns so hard with Jane that he has to go and Google how to get out of the friend zone. Man. Good thing this is not in the real world, because I swear that Google search is a direct pipeline to Andrew Tate content. Oh, and then the dog eats a truth gummy that Mal had made for Carlos so he could finally confess to Jane and not screw it up. And so now we've got a talking dog, which, well, the lip movement on this thing is kind of cursed. And so now finally, finally, we get a look at the villains. My god, the pacing on this thing. It could use some work. Snip up that script a little bit. Like, the runtime is almost two hours and it's taken 20 minutes just to set up the bare bones start of the plot and meet the villain. The villain is, of course, Uma, the daughter of Ursula, with her main goons, Harry, the son of Hook, and um, someone, the son of Gaston. And honestly, you got to say, Gaston's kid, legit funny. Had some good lines here, although not very intimidating, is it? Having their gang headquarters in a fish and chip store. Also, why are they pirate-themed? Like, wasn't there a magic barrier? They can't go out on the water. Just seem like poses to me. After all, Mal can't even swim, so... Yeah. Anyway, they do a villain song here, and it's a fine song, but it felt out of place for the villain. Like, the wrong tone. And Hook's rap section? Yeah, nah. Also, the dance moves were lame. It just... It didn't hit like the other song earlier, or the songs later. I'll put it that way. And then Ursula tells him to pipe down with a massive tentacle. And I gotta ask, if Ursula's half octopus, who mated with her? Fess up, boys. And how did she give birth? Like... Is her reproductive side octopus? Why is Uma not always half octopus like her mum? I have many questions. I mean, 
I probably don't want to dive too far into that line of inquiry, but still, I am rather curious about it all. We then continue on back to Mal and Ben's romantic date, which you know, I honestly didn't like this scene. I was all aboard the romance storyline in the first movie, but here feels a bit off. The weird face caressing, the really stilted dialogue, the lacking chemistry. At first I was like, oh, well that must be the point of the scene. It's awkward because, you know, dating's awkward and they're going through some troubles. Because then he even finds out about the magic she's been doing, they have a big argument. But then in the argument scene, something still felt off. Like, soap opera levels of bad acting. One gives their line, there's a pause, the other replies. You know, they're meant to be an intense argument, but it just felt off. And yeah, also, Ben, chill out, son. She's using magic. So what? Like I said in the first movie, why not use magic? Like, seriously, it's so convenient and doesn't have drawbacks, in my opinion. Like, how cucked is this society? That they're willing to toss all of that awesomeness away and lock it in a museum. I blame Beast. When in doubt, blame Beast. Bro ruled over this kingdom and phased out magic almost completely in favor of technology. You should use both. What an absolute muppet this man is. And so yeah, now we have more drama. Mal feels like she can't live up to what Ben needs her to be, etc, etc. You know, a classic sequel plot for romantic storylines, very stock standard. But this scene wasn't it. And so Mal decides that running away to the Isle of the Lost is a much better plan than staying to talk it out. And I get it, honestly. I too overreacted to things when I was a teenager. But still, going back to the open air prison's a bit drastic. Yeah, she steals, or well, not really steals. She takes the motor scooter that Ben bought her. She takes her lizard mum, who's never referenced again, and she scrams. She's out of there. And also the effects of the bike she's crossing the water. <laughs> And as she arrives, we have a scene with a very obvious stunt double driving. God, I just love the cheapness of everything. It just adds to the charm. You'll love to see it. Classic B-movie. Back in Auradon, we have a scene where Ben's gone full workaholic instead of trying to find his very obviously upset girlfriend. Are we sure that somebody who's in the middle of a crash and burn teenage romance is fit to rule? I know I keep bringing it up, but I am very right. Also, a portrait of himself in his own office. Hmm, that's a choice. Bit of a blowhard, don't you reckon? Evie comes in, it's revealed that Mal has left, and ooh, it's very sad. But not for long, as we're only half an hour in, with an hour and twenty to go. I reckon these crazy kids are gonna work it out. Had to chuckle at Ben referencing how he has a beast mode. I have the faintest tickle of a memory about this being potentially the cringiest part of the film by far, so hopefully when he does activate his beast mode, he lives up to that hype. But it's then back to Mal, she makes her way inside Lady Tremaine's old store, and really, the stepmother from Cinderella? Like, I know she was bad and abusive, but locking her up in a prison with her daughters and any potential future grandkids? Was she that bad? I mean, shit, look at this kid. She seems so sweet. How the hell is she locked on the prison island? This seems deeply unfair. And then she gives Mal a makeover, the hook dude comes in, he threatens him, he eats Mal's chewed gum. Why? DISGUSTING! Ooh, freak, kill him, kill him with fire, throw the whole man away. The heroes then assemble to head to the island to bring back Mal, and think that wearing a beanie is going to be enough to convince people that Ben is just some random street urchin from the island. <laughs> I mean, he's on TV on the aisle regularly. They have TV service there. And on top of that, he's like the biggest celebrity around in this world. Come on. Also, I love the dog tried to come with them, and somehow even got himself into a combat suit for the occasion. I also just wish he went to. They arrive on the island by limo across the obvious magical golden bridge and apparently nobody notices from either side that this thing lit up. And then they think that covering the limo in a couple of tarps is going to properly hide it. <sighs> Ooh, I wonder what's under this car shaped tarp. <laughs> and then we come to the next song, Chillin' Like a Villain, another good one. And this one is genuinely funny as they try to teach straight laced Ben how to be a cool and collected delinquent. Honestly, the actor for Ben was so good in this sequence, looking so completely out of his element and out of place. But this whole song means nothing, as they immediately get spotted by Gaston's son, who recognizes Ben from the posters, and thus goes off to tell Uma that they're there. <laughs> All of that singing and dancing, just to immediately fail. Oh man, you love to see it. You love to see it. And then not only that, he gets dumped instantly. Ouch! And then he's kidnapped and held hostage. Poor Ben, taking owls left and right. He is not having a good day today. So, whoopsie! But Mal goes off to save him at the chip shop, and they have an arm wrestling contest for custody of Ben and for the wand, which Mal loses, even though she was whooping ass, which felt forced for the plot, honestly. But whatever, what do I know? And also, she just shreds Uma in every single verbal exchange. <laughs> How am I supposed to take Shrimpy seriously now? 
But hey, luckily Carlos has a convenient 3D printer in his bedroom back at the school, so him and Jay go off to do that, print off a fake wand, and Evie and Mal go to make smoke bombs. Evie meets Dizzy again. My god, this kid's just so sweet and wholesome. Are you seriously telling me she deserves a life sentence? Beast, where you at? I'll be real, I love the movie, but here it begins to drag. You'd expect that the film is going to be building to the big finale. They're going to save Ben. He commits to making more change. It's all happy endings. 20 to 25 minutes, maybe 30 minutes, and we're there. But nope, we're an hour in almost, with an hour to go! And so I suffered through these filler scenes that did little for the story overall. Chad makes an action figure of himself. <laughs> I mean, this did make me laugh. Lonnie finds out they're making a fake wand. And the girls bond back on the aisle over a song. Also got mega romance vibes from this song. Like, and how the scene play out. The lyrics of the song, the blocking of the scene, the flashback, the looks, pressing foreheads. Am I the only one that got that vibe? Like, look at this, look at this. I don't know, maybe I'm seeing things. Regardless though, it's all very wholesome, very nice. And yeah, the song is a banger. After all, for some reason, the franchise almost never misses with the music. The boys then get the fake wand. They still don't bring the dog with them. Missed opportunity. And then they have to dodge the likes of Doug before picking up Lonnie as a tag along for the quest back to the aisle to save Ben. Sure, why not? We have Uma and Harry interrogate Ben, and I gotta say, the dude playing Hook, he needs to calm down. Dude is playing this way, way, way too over the top, to the point that it comes across as a way too tryhard. Cringy. You said I could hook him. <sighs> Cringe, but like not in a good way. More watching a middle school drama performance and there's that one kid who thinks he's top shit, but he's actually making an ass of himself. That's my perspective on this dude. And really, it's made worse by the fact that the other pirate characters are not like that. So he looks really goofy by comparison. Bad luck. And then we have a heart-to-heart -heart scene where Ben talks to Uma. He tries to convince her to do the right thing. He apologizes for his asshole dad and whatnot. And also just kind of forgetting about the rest of the kids on the Isle of the Lost. Yeah, that's a big time Al. Whoopsie. But like I said earlier, we still have like an hour left. So no chance Uma's having a change of heart yet. But yeah, at this point, it became clear to me that a redemption of some sort is in this character's future. I mean, she's not really even that bad at the end of the day. Carlos, Jay, Lonnie, and somehow Dude arrive at the island. And how did Dude sneak into the back of the car? into the boot, into the trunk. He can talk, sure, but still, how? He doesn't have hands. Anyway, they then have a pretty hype battle song, or at least the chorus of the song is hype, the rapping not so much, and then a very, very long combat sequence. Gotta gobble up some of that runtime. And yeah, nothing much to note here, other than I think it was pretty good for what it was. Reminds me of a low-budget Pirates of the Caribbean fight, and also at least two of these young pirates got tossed into shark-infested waters with killer sharks. They make sure to say that. So, rest in peace to those guys, I guess. The heroes escape, but like idiots, they left the spell book behind, so, whoops. Although, I would have figured that the fairy godmother had put the barrier back up, you know, after the Maleficent fiasco, so, how'd they even use it? After all, Mal and her mum had the book the whole time, and they could only use it once in Auradon, so, same with the magic mirror? Guess we'll just ignore that part. Because if the anti-magic barrier was down, well, then wouldn't more villains, you know, like Ursula, the sea witch, have escaped in the six months that have passed? Just a thought. They escape, we have that sappy sentimental scene to build up to the finale. The four kids from the aisle decide they can't hide who they are. Lonnie's named the new captain of the sword fighting team to get through the sexist rule book with a loophole. Doug has a moment of panic that Evie has finally realized that she's out of his league and given him the boot, but nope, little dude's still paddling for now. And then Carlos and Jane have a cute romantic moment. And then I got sad that that actor's dead again, just like last time, and so I stopped caring about the movie for a good five minutes, but I didn't really miss much, as there really is just a couple of minutes of intro to the cotillion on the party boat, not much going on, then whoopsie, now Ben's supposedly in love with Uma, and you know, this poor dude can't catch a break, love potions, spells, dude is constantly losing his ability to consent. Although, as the casual onlooker, surely it just looks like this dude's a massive dick. Like, he publicly dumped Audrey at the sports game over a song. Now he publicly dumps Mal for Uma at a massive grand party, celebrating Mal. Like, the world would surely just think, whoa, the new king's an asshole, isn't he? <laughs> and also, how does nobody realize what's going on here? Like, come on now, Mal at the very least should be like, oh, hmm, he's been mind controlled. But it takes until the last second for anybody to realize that. Literally takes him being a massive asshole, which is completely out of character, like yelling and stuff to actually do it. And then True Love's Kiss ends up breaking the spell. Uma becomes a giant octopus. Mel's a giant dragon. We have the battle of the very terrible CGI. Ben, ah, uh, he has that moment I can only vaguely remember <laughs> where for some reason he has beast qualities and he does this cringy roar like he's an eight-year-old pretending to be a lion on the couch. 
and then he jumps into the water. The battle ends very anticlimactically with him talking them both down. From in the water, Uma leaves. There's a big kiss. Dizzy's freed from the aisle. Mal gives up her magic book. Oh, fine. Then we have another song to finish off. Good times. And a cliffhanger or anything the third movie. Nice. Also, what a terrible boat. Look at this. Pretty sure a boat is meant to have drainage so the deck does not stay flooded in the case of a big wave. But yeah, I'll be real. This one just wasn't as good as the first one by a long shot in my eyes. It still manages to be weirdly fun to watch. A bit long, but still fun. You don't see a lot of stuff like this these days, you know? It's usually either terrible stuff or so bad it's good. But this is like, well, yes, it's cheap as hell. Poor quality, but it's so goofy and fun and silly. Kind of like Once Upon a Time. I just can't help but love it. And so yes, hell yes, yes with all of it. We'll be back for the third one at some point. And so with all that being said, these have been my opinions, and now I'd like to hear yours. What do you think of Descendants 2? Are you with me? Maybe you think it actually sucks. I'm curious for your thoughts, so make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know.